Okay, so, ooh, nice. Uh, Dustin Kasman is going to talk about how to implement an uh, infotainment system using QtQuick. So please give a round of applause. All right. All right. Thank you. So, either, uh, first of all, congratulations for lasting through the first day. It's the end of a long day. So, you either are in here because you're very interested in what I'm going to talk about, or you just needed a quiet place to text until the food comes out later, right? So. All right, so I'll make this quick because I know this is a long day for everybody. So, um, my name is uh, Dustin Kassman. I'm a uh, engineering project manager for ICS, and um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the experiences we've had implementing um, various IVIs using uh, Qt Quick and the Qt um, platforms to to make that happen. So. So, um, as you heard from the last speaker, if you were here, he basically was talking about that the automotive um, infotainment systems is a changing environment right now. We have a lot of, uh, there's, they're everywhere, but they have a lot of different levels of quality and the levels of functionality. Um, most of them to date right now are based on proprietary solutions from uh, manufacturers and um, and then there are some that are from the tier ones as well, like QNX and Intel and, and a few of those. And then we also heard that we, the announcement last week of some more open source options in terms of the, what the QT company is now embarking on. We can look forward to that. Um, obviously, Geneva and those in that place. Um, at this point in time, the market is still evolving. There's no clear winners yet. Um, but we do know that in order to be successful, whatever it is, the, the winners are going to have to be scalable and flexible. That's what the manufacturers of the vehicles are going to demand. Be able to do multiple tasks at the same time and get good performance. Um, be able to be flexible in product lines as well as, as models. And um, support a variety of, of hardware. And of course, since no one country has any claim on cars only, they're sold worldwide, it has to have support for localization built into it as well. And these are some of the things that we've run into in our experiences. So um, we have worked on several different ones, for everything from um, the stuff, the in-flight entertainment stuff that's flying in the Dreamliners for Norwegian Airlines to the opposite end of the spectrum, um, stuff that's in tractors right now from a global agricultural equipment manufacturer, the in, in, uh, touchscreen controls. And then um, in terms of actual, when people think of vehicles, they usually think of cars and trucks and stuff. And in terms of that space, um, we've worked uh, a proof of concept for the Intel's uh, automotive platform that they have. And that was shown both at, uh, at CES last year, as well as um, uh, Jaguar Land Rover did uh, a show in England with another demo that we did for them as well. And most of all, there are on the showroom floors now some 2016 vehicles that have our work in them from uh, one of the major Detroit manufacturers. So. Um, the important thing about this is, first of all, we have some real world experience working with QT and QT Quick in this type of environment. And that's what I want to share a little bit with you today. Um, I will try to uh, make it quick without being uh, too much of a rush and a plus. Of, so um, the designs that we've used have been focused on a couple of things. One of them is uh, a functional core with uh, a decoupled front end so that you can have various user interfaces and features without having to change the core, and I'll talk about that. Um, the ability to add functionality without having to, to, to rebuild the entire application. So if you have a car that has a certain feature that's not available on the other, or you've got something in the field and now a new feature comes out, you can add that to it as well. Um, not all of the software, anytime a new manufacturer works on their IVI, they're going to get solutions from various different places. 
So we have a framework that allows those various pieces to be pulled in together. So, um, and mainly just getting just the flexibility. Obviously, I mentioned localization. That's in there as well. And most of all, you have to have some really good uh, responsive both startup time from the time you turned the, the key until um, as well as the interactive and the response. So let me tell you a little bit about how we've done that. So what we've done here, obviously, is we have a looks very familiar to a lot of it's pretty standard um, layer diagram with um, hardware starting on the bottom. In this case, it happens to be the Intel's platform in this example. Of course, we've got other we've got it running on several different platforms, and and I guess I should um, say that what we're not selling a, a framework or anything here, right? What we have done is taking, taking existing functionality that is built into QT, built into QT Quick, and use those features to form a, a solution that's very flexible. It can be used um, across any platform by anybody. Um, it's just, again, just sharing our experiences. So, um, so starting from the top down, the user interface, of course, is all done in QT Quick. Um, it's great multi-touch support. More and more vehicles are, are uh, relying on that, and you look second rate if they don't have that capabilities. The heart of the stuff is what we call the view controller, um, which basically manages the environment, manages the screen real estate, and also loads and unloads the applications. And I'll get into that into a little bit more detail. So the applications are in the form of plugins, which have uh, used the model view controller format. So that the idea is they have a presentation or a visualization area. You have the functionality area, and then you've got the interface into um, the rest of the system. And, uh, and then that sits on top. In this case, we have what we call the, the IASQT bridge. It's named that because the Intel Automotive Services, that was the API that we started with. On other platforms, it's going to um, it's serve the same functionality, may have a different name. The idea is that it now maps the functionality of the underlying hardware and the API that we got from Intel into um, nomenclature that the QT can use signals and slots and properties. And it, so it makes that very, very um, transparent. So the things that you're going to get, so a plugin, let's we'll talk about that. So a plugin is going to provide functionality, right? So it might be the, the media plugin in this case, um, that's a, a, or even as fine tuned as a radio plugin, but probably more the media plugin or a navigation area or something or like that. Um, it may not have a visual component. It's not required to do that. The audio controller, which manages where the audio comes from and where it ends up, obviously doesn't have a user interface at all. Um, they are C++ shared objects, okay, and they're loaded at uh, runtime. It can be C++ that is written and compiled right into the application, or it can be an external pro um, process that's running outside the system that is then um, embedded into the user interface part of it. But overall, the view controller is the piece that manages and marshals all of that. So um, I already mentioned that, that the visualization layer, of course, is QT Quick. Um, we take a lot of advantage of what we call of the resources and templates to make some flexibility in the layout. I'll cover that in a second. And also a lot of the signals and slots and messaging to be able to communicate between this, this disparate parts. But overall, we get really, really good performance out of this, um, out of this organization. So one of the keys here I, these are, uh, is that the pieces on top are called directly into the layers below. So um, there are, they are dependent upon the lower layers. But the converse is not true. The, the lower layers are not dependent on. So they just emit signals which the upper, upper pieces will pick up. The advantage of this is, is that we can completely take that visualization layer out, and we can put another piece in if, if um, you're moving from you know, this little 
low-end vehicle that has only a few things to, um, to something that's higher up and has much more power. So I'm not going to go into great detail, so don't panic, I'm not going into great detail here. The main point is this lays out a little bit about how the view controller loads the plugins at startup. They basically, um, the, again, they're shared objects, they're, they're brought in. When the plugin is ready to go, it then emits a, a signal so that um, the view controller knows it's set. View controller can query it for some information, like for example, what name to use when it puts on the menus and things like that, and also where on the screen it wants to, uh, it wants to live. So just an example here. This is a home page that we've designed. On the very top is a notification bar, just some status of things. That's owned by the view controller. The bottom part, which is the menu, that's also owned by the view controller. This, all of the content between those two is um, provided from a plugins. In this case, you actually see three plugins. Um, the media plugin up on the side, the climate plugin below that, and then the navigation plugin that um, is there on the other side. If you go to the, the climate um, page on the bottom there, now the climate will actually own the whole entire screen and its user interface com changes completely. It has a lot more details about what you can control. And the same thing if you go to the media. So the point of it is, is that a user interface can have different manifestations depending upon where and when it shows up. And again, that's all coming from the plugin um, and defined by the plugin. So, um, so enough of so we've, in the plugins. I mentioned that you can have outside stuff, um, outside um, projects coming in and applications. So, how in the world do you get those to show up within, for example? Um, within the user interface. For example, you saw the map there with the navigation. That's a third party application. When it's running, it thinks it owns the whole entire screen. Has no user interface, has no touch into it. We use uh, the Wayland uh, compositor to be able to interlay that within the application. And that way, um, we can place it where we want. But more than that, we can also place QT layers over the top of it to give the user interface the interaction that we want to have. This illustration is going to show how we did um, how we did the video player. So we used the Cinema video player, and um, so on the very bottom there is the HMI framework and menu. That is the view controller. The blue layer above it that is the area owned by the plugin, and it's just QML. Right, and on its QML, it has a defined window that says this is where the video screen's gonna go. If you were to look at it without the video stuff loaded, you'd see a nice blank, okay? When that started, then it gets mapped into that, into that area. The top layer there is also owned by the plugin and it's just a translucent um, layer placed over the top of the, of the actual play in video so that when somebody touches that, the QML picks up the touch and then um, shows those controls. Then they pause, fast forward, rewind, etc. That stuff gets passed through um, to the to the video player. Has no idea that it's that it has that overlay on the top of it. Has no idea that it's embedded within the within the HMI, and uh, and it makes it very 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 slick um, solution. So I mentioned the, the flexibility. So what you see here are two very different um, uh, user interfaces for the section of the same IVI. Okay? And this was done using um, uh, templates and, RC, uh, and RCC files. Um, that I mentioned the three layers. Of the, so the top layer was replaced with from the one on the left to the right, or reverse of ISA can be done on the fly. Underneath the controller layer and the and all that stuff, exactly the same, right? So this one, you've got buttons for choosing. That one, you've got a carousel you spin. If you touch the media carousel, 
is exactly the same to the back end as if you touch the media button there. No difference. It works very, very, uh, gives you, again, a lot of flexibility and the and, uh, performance is very good. So, um, okay, so if, you, if, the, if the RCC files don't work, we also are use assets and being able to have alternate assets to, to choose from. Sometimes you need a combination of those. This is primarily using the Q file selector, which is a, really works well in order to be able to, to draw out um, different aspects based upon um, the, uh, the criteria. So let me actually show you. It's going to make it a little better than me stumbling around. So what we've got here is, and it may, I hope, apologize if it's hard to see, but we have different QML based upon different criteria. So for example, we've got, when I'm focusing on the pellet QML, which will uh, give us some of the colors. And if, um, if the file selector is given with green theme and night move, it'll focus all the way and come down. And we have both green theme and night. If that's the case, it chooses number one, loads that QML, and that's what gets done. That's what gets used on the screen. If for some reason you only have green but no night, it ends up with number two, and it loads that QML instead. If, um, if you had night and not green, obviously you get number three, and obviously if you have neither one of those, then um, it'll, it'll use pellet QML from up there on number four. Again, this is a feature that's built into Qt and Qt Quick, and the performance in that, we use it a lot, the performance is very, very uh, fast. This is another example. Um, that uh, shows how we also use this for different um, makes and models. So you can see there's difference between rows. So on the bottom, we use different images based upon if you've got a sedan or an SUV or a roadster, okay? And based upon what was sent into the selector, you're gonna get one of those categories automatically. Um, but again, you can also, and you see on the top too that the roadster also not only just has different images, also has different um, has different QML as well. So, all right, screen orientation. Um, we use the screen orientation support that's built into that's built into Qt. Um, in most vehicles, you're not going to have a screen that's going to change orientation unless you happen to tip it on its side. We won't go there, but. Um, however, you may have a car, a, a manufacturer that has different models that have orientations that are different. Using this capability that's built into the, inf the infrastructure, we can support um, different layouts very easily. Now, um, one thing that we've added in is the ability to save key value pairs. So even though the vehicle is shut off, you have to carry over um, states from one to the other. Um, such as, you know, what color the person, the driver chose, or what was the last active application. So our, we use the framework also to be able to um, keep track of those types of states. Again, when a state changes, such as somebody chooses a different color, signal is, is emitted, and all of the plugins will receive that signal, say, you know, change to this color, and then they will use the file selectors to, to um, choose the the assets and or the QML that corresponds with that color. Again, it's all handled very nicely by the infrastructure in the system. So, localization. And we didn't invent anything new here, right? There's very good localization support in this toolkit. We take advantage of that. Um, what we have experienced in it, though, is that um, each plugin is responsible for loading its own localization, so when it receives the, uh, the message that it needs to change, it does that. Uh, we have very good, again, performance as well in moving between uh, different locales. Um, and it, again, it's just all part of the plugin stuff and part of the infrastructure with, um, with Qt. Occasionally, when you change languages, you may also need to change colors. Perhaps a color means something different in one language, or perhaps you've got an icon that now needs to change for something that's 
the, again, the file selector al allows us to do that as uh, very easy. And it, it, once you have the stuff set up and deposited in the right place in the file system, it is uh, transparent to the application. It just happens. So, um, so a couple of more slides, and I'll let you, and uh, I'll have a few I'll open for some questions. So. We have these uh, disparate pieces here of application. So we know how to share the framework. We know how to get them all loaded, but there are still silos. So we have a messaging system that we use to be able to communicate back and forth. This messaging system, for example, is used when the phone call comes in. So the phone plug-in will send out a message to say, hey, whoever is playing media, if you are, mute the, uh, pause what you're playing, and, all, and, um, and so that way the music will stop, phone's taken care of, then when um, the phone's done, the phone call's completed, the phone plug-in then uh, sends out another message to restart um, what was being played. That way your movie or whatever doesn't, you don't lose part of it while the call's taking place. The phone plug-in has no idea who owns um, who was playing music or if anybody was at all, but the messaging system makes it all very transparent to it. So, um, fast performance. So this is very cool because we have everything in pieces. We have plugins. We can choose which plugins to load when. So if, you, if the view controller starts and it says, okay, the last thing the person was doing when they turned off the key was looking at their maps, that's the plugin that gets loaded first. If, um, and even so, or if the last thing that uh, they were doing was listening to music, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load the, the media plug-in, but we're going to load the controller part first, so the controller is what's actually going to play the songs. We'll get the user interface loaded afterwards, but at least you get the music and stuff going right back. We have been able to do um, very uh, startup in from, from cold start to a functioning user interface in two seconds with uh, using this technique. And that's on, a, that's on the, the Intel box, which is a fundamental Linux box. So, so just summarizing, um, what we've done is we've used the pieces that are in Qt and in QML already to be able to create um, a, a flexible framework using those tools to be able to load pieces as needed, to be able to take and, and uh, substitute uh, user interface components on the fly, to be able to integrate external applications and show them within the user interface. Um, it makes it very easy, very flexible. You can use the, the same underlying thing to, to support your, you know, your low end, basic model to your high-end gold-plated, and uh, nobody would know that it's the same hardware running it. Nobody would know that it's the same, um, it's the same uh, IVI. It would look custom for each one. One might have more features than the other. It's all there. So um, we've been very, very happy with this solution and this approach. We've used it multiple times, as you can see. Um, Nice thing about this is too is that it's not limited to the IBIs. You obviously can use this in many other applications, that same style or the bits and pieces of it. So, um, any questions? Or did you all truly come in here to find a place to sit and text quietly? <laughs> yes, sir. Right, okay, so the question was basically, we got a lot of stuff here. So how do you get this stuff to work when you've got really limited pl uh, hardware? Did I summarize it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. So, so the idea is with the plugins is yes, you can load them on demand. Okay. Um, and also you can and you can um, overall the 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 pieces because we're not really adding anything to it. The pieces are very small, as the, as they are. And, um, but you can load them, but you can load them on demand. You can also do, as I said, we've load, um, and this is handled for you, you load the controller piece if you don't use. So for example, if you're listening to music and you're on the navigation screen, why do you need the, uh, 
controls for the audio, right? Those aren't even, uh, those aren't even shown because that, that page is not there. Um, ultimately, yeah, if you, if you get to a system that's got really, really slow processors and tight memory and stuff, you're going to have to do some tuning and stuff. But so far, um, you know, we've been able to run it on a, everything. I mean, we've got a version that's been running on a Pi, and we've got the stuff on the, uh, the Minnow board out there right now. So did I, I hope I answered your question. Okay. Okay, so, so, so for example, navigation is a very good example. So if we load navigation, okay, um, there's a lot of that, you know, obviously the display of the map, and then there's also being able to tell you where to go next and all that stuff. So in this case, it, it was a third-party uh, third application, so we didn't have access to the source on it. Normally, you would say, okay, we, we need the navigation part and the visualization part separated a little bit more. We didn't have that luxury. So, um, so the navigation, once it's started, will tend to run in the background because you clearly don't want to get lost. Um, but other things like um, some of the other ones, you can send messages and basically say, if you're not busy, go to sleep, and then uh, and they can take them out. They can take themselves out of memory, and if we need to, we can reload them back in. So. I think I'm good on time. I will be. And out around here, and also I'll be at the thing, so come by the booth or whatever. I'll be glad to answer questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. Thank you very much. Eternal applause.